microphone? Yeah. We take just this once. Okay. Um, hello, welcome to our talk, and uh, we are very glad to see you all and that you all could make it up so early in the morning to visit our talk. Uh, we would like to introduce ourselves. So, um, my name is uh, Markus Liebig. I'm from the project We Dig It from the University of the Arts in Bremen. And, uh, I'm Anja Cambria Oellermann. I'm a sonographer and I also work at the University of Arts. And I'm working on this particular project on the design concept and implementation. Hello, I'm Gottfried Hofmann by Blender Diplom. And I'm a trainer and consultant for the software Blender. And on this project, I did work on the Hubs Blender exporter and created a few of the behavior graphs we're going to see. I'm Frederik Steinmetz. I'm his partner at Blender Diplom. I do Python programming, Blender, modeling, texturing, rendering, everything, and I also like Unity. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, um, to introduce the project, um, the project we did is founded by the uh, BMBF in Germany. So the German government decided to put a lot of money into the universities to support them in better digitalizing their education uh, structures. So, and we were one of the projects uh, that um, were funded. And uh, then we um, thought about what, what can digitalization bring benefits to classic art education. And uh, the initial idea of the project was that uh, I myself am educated as a product designer and as a product designer in a university you have, um, yeah, you, 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 one semester you're working on your designs and at the end of the semester you're trying to ex, uh, exhibit them and, and make an exhibition. So, and, and every art school uh, is having this yearly uh, really big exhibition where everything is shown and you put a lot of effort onto it. And uh, you, you think about the room, you think about the lighting, how this all fits together. And this has no uh, relation to when you have an online appearance. So you have a project website and then there's a text and there's some photos, but nothing that really competes to that. And this was the initial idea. How can we put these exhibition efforts into the web? And uh, the second thought would be, uh, okay, how can we do this in 3D? And uh, um, then uh, the decision was yes. So, and then we thought a bit more. And uh, we are one of the two universities in, Bremen, uh, in, in Germany that has as well fine arts as music. And then soon the idea came up, uh, OK, um, why can't we just support concerts as well? And then when you go around the university and ask the people what would they like, you get answers. So and then soon uh, the answer came up, oh, we have these, uh, uh, these other university in Africa, we have a cooperation with, can we interact with them on the platform? And um, finally, at, at this stage, at last, we decided to go open source because uh, you don't want to mess around with licenses. So does they have or you don't want to discuss which industry standard is the right right one. Yeah, so we, we decided, yeah, we go open source. And uh, this was one idea, uh, one, one reason for it. The other reason was we want to contribute. So I think open source is a great idea. And if we can uh, be part of it and leave something for the next one who picks this up, um, we, we decided to go and, and mainly focus on open source on this project. Um, so the, the stage we n now present is, is a, a result of a few painful iterations. So we, we made some loops. So the first hard lesson we had to learn was uh, if you work in the German public service, you can't offer programmers the contracts they like. Yeah. So um, then um, the second lesson we had to learn was uh, um, open source projects aren't always as solid as blenders. So uh, the first uh, launch we had was on based on Matrix and on Third Room. And a few weeks uh, after we set up everything on Third Room, Third Room was uh, discontinued. So we, we switched to uh, Mozilla Hubs. 
Um, so we set everything on Mozilla Hubs. We avoided Mozilla Hubs before because the backend of Mozilla Hubs wasn't at that stage not really open source. Um, but then we switched and uh, I think two or three weeks after we finished everything on Mozilla Hubs, Mozilla Hubs was also be announced as discontinued. <laughs> Um, then we switched to a different provider that says, ah, I can host this as well, so he's also discontinued. So we, uh, we felt a bit unlucky um, and uh, we, a short time we thought about using Autodesk products just to see if we already would rack them up. But um, now we're hosting everything by ourselves and um, yeah, the solution we now show is based on Blender, Blender and now called Hubs former called Mozilla Hubs, and we are uh, relating also on, on uh, other open source projects we, we just take over and um, develop further. So one, one people who is responsible is sitting here, uh, and we are very thankful for this. And um, the, the goal uh, we, we had was to, to develop solutions for exhibitions in the virtual space so and and to give the users tools they might need and maybe um, even give them better opportunities in a virtual reality than in the real life so just imagine if you decide for whatever reason you need a waterfall inside your exhibition room if you want to do this in real life this is quite a complex task um, but if you want to animate this uh, you're it's quite easy um, and uh, yeah, we had the main focus was our own university, but everything should be adoptable by anybody else. So the, um, the final goal is that at the end of the project, we have a package and a documentation everybody can pick up and set this up for themselves. So what we did was we uh, rebuilt our own university. We have a very nice uh, building that uh, Anya will show up uh, soon. Oh yes, yeah, we have a, so, yeah. the photos on the left side are real photos from our university. And uh, we did this for two reasons. Uh, the one reason was we wanted to have the virtual location uh, identical to the real location. So if you visit us and, and you see something interesting and you visit us on the yearly um, exhibition day, so uh, then you know where to go if you want to find the same uh, content uh, or the same persons. Um, and uh, the second uh, reason was we, we are based in an old storage building for cotton or coffee in the former days. And this is strictly built in a 5 to 5 meter grid. So if you build the grid 5 to 5 once, so you just duplicate it and you get the, the building uh, quite easy uh, rebuild it. So our other building is a bit like uh, Castle Hogwarts. So if we want to digitize this, we, we need to run around two years with the 3D scanner. Um, and um, the concept uh, we developed was uh, that we rebuilt the floors of our building and the outside. But if you leave the floor and if you pass a door to an exhibition room, you're off the limit. So you, you don't have to have any um, any more relations to the building itself, so you can have a, a room like you imagine. But uh, Anja will show you now uh, how this looks. Yes, perfect. I just want to add quickly that last time we've talked to some of you about this project and I'm now really happy that within a year we are able to show you this work in process. Um, we will show you some videos of the implementation and then we're gonna give over to Gottfried and Frederik and they will explain the corresponding Blender files and behavior graphs that um, we are using. So we're gonna start with the virtual outer, outer area. Um, so this is usually the first space that the visitors um, enter. And um, as Markus already told you, this is our old, uh, our um, university building, it's an old harbor building, and um, it was rebuilt by one of our students, Tristan, who is also part of our team. So. The first thing that you're going to see is this how to navigate pop-up, and you can basically close it by just clicking on it, 
And that's the first behavior graph that we are using, so it's a quite simple one. Um, we are also using some uh, hubs add-on that are regularly in the hubs add-on um, included. And it's the simple water component for the white open sea that you can see. And the UV scrolling for the slowly moving clouds on the sky. If you concentrate, you can see it. Yes. You can also jump directly to some of the exhibition spaces through those linked posters or you enter the ground floor through the main entrance. And whenever you see those particles flying, um, that's the a portal that you can enter. The Hubs add-on has already some interactive elements included, for example, this spawner object that we're using for our logo. Sometimes it reacts to gravity, sometimes it doesn't. We still need to figure out when and why. Um, yeah, but you can try to build a tower with it. With gravity, it's a bit harder. So here in the back, you can already see our a dome for the interactive demo room that Gottfried and Frederik will show later. But to get there, we implemented another behavior graph that you're going to experience in a minute. Yes. So those are stepping stones that are appearing um, corresponding to the gamer's position. And that's the clue for Frederik. So yeah, Mozilla Hubs is, uh, at the moment it's two separate add-ons, but it's going to be unified into one. One is the Hubs components, which means if you enable this, you can you have the option of adding components to Blender objects. We'll have a look at that later. And the more advanced one, uh, where the Hubs you can't live without, because otherwise it won't uh, export as a GLB that can be read by Mozilla Hubs when you export it and upload it. And the other one is the behavior graph, which is optional, but with the hubs uh, components alone, you'll soon uh, get, you'll soon have to push the boundaries because um, the only interactivity like Anya just mentioned is basically those spawners where an object gets spawned when you drag it. All the rest, like even clicking on stuff, you need the behavior graph for even the most basic stuff. So once you enable the behavior graph add-on, it fits seamlessly into the Blender, um, into the Blender node editor. It works just like you would expect. And this is the example of the stepping stones. Just as a, this would, I would say is a normal size behavior graph on a regular normal interacting object. So let's have a look at why, what's um, different. Because in Blender you have the linear timeline, meaning you have three states. One is play, one is pause, one is backwards, reverse. And in most of the behavior, in most of the graphs, let's subtract animation nodes at this time, you have one distinct output. Like for the shader graph, you have either a surface or a volume output, but that is the output. For the geometry nodes, you have one geometry output. You can have some parameters, but they're all considered one output node. Whereas in a behavior graph, you can have multiple outputs. And that is because the behavior graph isn't so much a mesh that produces one product, but it's an interactive thing. Because as opposed to the linear time in Blender, here you can turn around, click on something, wait for a bit, click on it again, go somewhere else, click on something else. So it's, abs it's the absolute opposite of linear. And we need to take this into account. And also we need triggers. So we don't have keyframes, what we do for animations. But for the regular behavior, we don't have keyframes because they need to be triggered by player behavior. And these triggers are um, marked by this um, play button or play logo. So they, they um, in the beginning, I'd say they're a bit, uh, it's a bit, it takes a bit getting used to them. For example, this one would just um, flip flop, which means every time we bump it, it changes its state. So every time we click the on interact, we click on the object, the flip-flop changes its state from on to off to on to off. And um, we can here we set the time scale of an action and we can either play it backwards or forwards depending on this. Uh, the flip-flop is true or false. So if I click on a door, it opens and if I click on it again, it closes again. This is the flip-flop. So this is a very useful, very basic node setup. Uh, the other thing you need uh, usually, as soon as you get a little more complex, is variables. So we can 
assign variables to entities and entities is basically uh, the fancy word for object. So each object can has, have as many variables as you want and these objects can interact. For example, here I would create a volume like a cube and if the player enters the volume, I just set this player is inside collider. This is a variable that I created. I set this to true and as soon as the player exits, I set this to false. And why would I do that? Why don't I just take the event? Well, this way we can propagate the event to other objects. So on tick means in every frame. So this action gets bumped. That's the white line. In every frame this action gets bumped. But we only want this to do anything if the player is inside the collider. So that we, we don't only want to interact when the player enters the collider, but we want it to interact when the player stays inside the collider. There's a note for that too, but uh, we're going to do it this way now. Uh, so in every bump we check, is the player inside the collider? If yes, we um, set uh, the entity property rotation and we add one degree. So this is like geometry node, it goes backwards. So whenever the true gets bumped, it checks, ah, there's an input, well, let's go backwards and see, ah, okay, since the last tick we add one degree in X rotation. So we rotate around the X axis, and if it's false, we just hide the entity. And since we have enough experts sitting here that will already see, well, once it's hidden, who cares if it's rotating? So this is the actual graph that does something. The other one's a very simplified version, just to make sure I don't get um, blamed for stuff like that. And the last example, this is the actual example of the stepping stones. What we do here is we need a gate because we don't have a null check. We cannot check if this player is null. And before anybody enters the room, the player will be null. So if we don't use the gate, then we get a null reference exception because it tries to find the transform and the position of a non-existent object. So what we do is this gate, it basically prevents the entire flow because it's a gate, it starts closed, and once a player enters the collision, then we can grab the player, it's no longer null or undefined, and then we can do our checking. So we just subtract the position of the player from the entity position. The entity is the object where this graphics is running on. We check the length, see how far the player is away from this, and then we check if it's less than two meters, we make the object visible. Uh, it's a tiny bit ineffective at this point, but we, um, it would be even more complex to get around this because in this, every frame, the visibility gets set. And uh, for programmers, this is not something you want to do, but the end user, this is just one bool. I don't think you won't see any uh, overhead, any lag, but uh, in theory, you should do a do once note behind that and we'll have a look at those later. And now let's take a look at those um, notes and the graph in general. And um, I claim that some people of you might have used something really similar already. So um, who's into game development? Cool. And who is using one of the following technologies like uh, Unreal Blueprints or uh, Unity Visual Scripting or uh, a Meteor Omnigraph and all those kind of things? Wouldn't it be really, really nice if all of those could talk together, because currently each one of those graph system is different from the others, wouldn't it be really nice if there was one standard that all of those programs are using? And um, this is what the Kronos group currently is trying to do. I mean, it might fail, but uh, maybe they succeed. They created, I mean, those are the people who gave us OpenGL, OpenCL, GLTF, uh, OpenXR. And now what they are trying to do is to integrate into the GLTF standard um, interactivity using those behavior graphs, and what we are seeing here, what we did see um, was some um, implementation based on an early draft of the behavior graphs by the Kronos group. So um, what uh, you did is uh, you took an earlier version of the um, behavior graphs by the Kronos group, implemented them in hubs, and so we can already use them. Even though it's still a draft on the uh, Kronos side, so they are still not finished, and um, the behavior graph add-on is not in the main branch of the um, hubs, but uh, what you can see is you can already use it. So this is like um, a glimpse into the future. And um, I think this hasn't been dropped that Blender at some point uh, wants to get an interactive mode. So the idea is for the future for the Blender developers that you can define interactivity inside Blender and then export 
to game engines, just like currently you're exporting to render engines. So uh, you don't have to use cycles in Blender, you can also export to Arnold and whatever. And I think this is the idea that um, the Blender developers have for the future. And this is actually pretty close. The, problem, the only problem we have is that currently in Blender we cannot see the, the, um, the interactivity we're creating. So whenever we are creating the interactivity, we have to export to hubs and uh, then see it in the browser. But up until that, this is already, I think, very close to what I hope is going to be the future. So back to the present and our university. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, we have now entered um, the ground floor in our building. And um, Marcus has already explained something about this building. And another characteristic is those really long and endless corridors. And it's also on four floors. So it's a huge building and there are a lot of doors. And whenever you see those particles, as I al already explained, you can enter a totally different exhibition room. Um, you can also enter or jump directly to those um, exhibition rooms through all those posters that you see on the walls. And in a minute, we are going to jump into one of those. Yes, we have now entered the exhibition space for electroacoustic music and sound art. And as you can see, it's already a more imaginative space um, where we want to exhibit audio files from our music students. And um, it's kind of the sound landscape with those waves. And within every sphere that you see, you can listen to a different um, sound file. And we've actually exported the audio files with the 3D audio information because those are 3D audio files um, within a video and projected those on the spheres. And you can click on the outside on play and then enter the sound file. So it's best to listen to it on your headphones because as I said, those are 3D files so you can really hear the sound move around you and those are now it's a more experimental um, sound artwork. Yes, we won't listen to every sphere, um, but you can see this black sphere um, here on the left. That's actually a 360 video that we can also integrate and it's a recording from one of our uh, sound installations at the university. In every exhibition room, you will find this door that leads you back to the corridor. We haven't used any behavior graphs in this room, but a lot of hubs components. So that's again, Frederick. The, when you look at the hubs component add-on, you can see that it's quite versatile. So I'm actually amazed how long this slip passed us. And once we realized that um, this needs, I'm going to say help, because Blender is developing so fast, uh, Gottfried and I joined the team um, and we managed to get it from 3.6 to 4.2 with the help of the rest of the team. So um, we gained a little pace, but Blender is still so fast. So you can see this add-on has been existing for a while, otherwise it wouldn't have that many components. I'm going to just briefly mention a few of them. You can, you can uh, most of them are self-explanatory. Audio is um, when you, well, play an audio. The audio source is a little more interesting because you um, have 3D sound. The audio source will recognize is the player left of the audio source and then play it for your right ear and so on. We have a link, which is very handy on the web. We have a mirror component, which is actually a secondary camera that gets projected onto a scene, uh, onto a plane. So basically, if you want to check out your own avatar, or if you just want some nice uh, mirror effect in your room, you can use the mirror component. We have um, rigid body physics, 
That means we can actually throw stuff through the air and in theory we can make a tower collapse and watch it, stuff like that. In theory it's possible. I don't know, we haven't test pushed the limits of the performance, so I can't really make that. And simple water, we've seen already. And video, this is a little unstable, but we're working on it. Um, it in theory it supports YouTube, Vimeo and all the good stuff, but it, uh, it does support reliably video that you put on your own server. So that's what we're doing and it works. So if you've been uh, working with game engines already, you might be familiar with the concept of a NAF mesh. Who here knows what the, not that many. NAF mesh is basically the cheapest way to achieve player collisions. Uh, for example, if you have a uh, wall and you want to make the player stop from going through that wall, you need collision detection, which is it's not that expensive anymore, the algorithms got very good, but it's a little unreliable. Maybe you've got played an action game where you, a grenade detonated next to you and it pushed you through a wall. That can happen with a NAF mesh. There's no chance of this happening and it's very cheap. All you need to do is select all the objects that you don't want the player to pass through and then create NAF mesh. It will treat them as collision and only the green area the player can ever enter. The problem with that is you don't have any dynamic colliders, which we will see in our demo room. So there is a closed door, but of course we have to make the NAF mesh allow the player to go through the door, which means you can't go through the closed door. Um, that's the drawback, but um, therefore it's fast and reliable. So you can see in the green areas I could walk, in the, in the uh, black areas I could not. And um, the, um, <clears throat> if you export a GLTF and you have an animation attached to an object, it will automatically play that animation, which is pretty handy but also pretty dangerous because, for example, you, if you're on frame 150 when you press export, your animation might start on frame 150. Also, it might start when the player, before the player enters the room. So, um, Either use the behavior graph to trigger the animation or you use a loop animation component which is not something that you um, usually, um, how do you say, um, expect in a GLTF, I guess, to not work out of the box. But there's reasons for that and, I mean, in the end, it's a simple click, add component, loop animation. So So the next room we're going to look at is the virtual fashion studio. I'm just going to start the video. And it's once again a more realistic architecture without any light baking at the moment. Um, but it has some extensions. So in the back we have a fitting room where we're showcasing um, artworks and designs from our students created with the software Clo 3 d So I noticed there are some Clo 3 d experts here. And what we're still working on, maybe you've seen it in the background, is the, in the integration of um, animations and the designs as animated characters. Um, as you can imagine, those designs, those fashion designs have a lot of vertices and the hubs file size limitation is quite low. So we still need to figure out a way how to get those two together. So on the other side, we have the basic pattern archive. That was actually a request from one of our professors. Um, he wants to provide his students with basic pattern cuts that uh, the students can adapt in Clo 3D for the future designs. So our, our idea is here that you're gonna, that you can click through a gallery um, those images in the back and simultaneously the character or the mannequin um, will change um, the, the um, clothes that it's wearing. And also what you can see here on the left is the mirror component that Frederick has explained earlier. So now it's clicking, yes. And that's actually, again, a behavior graph. 
So I'm gonna give over to you. So the, we, um, we actually stored quite a few more um, of these, or we wanted to, but they were very high poorly. So in theory, we wanted to um, have these button go through 10 different outfits and models. So in theory, we'd love to have lists. And I was promised they are coming, and I'm glad to help developing that. But for now, we don't have lists, which means we can't iterate through different models. So every material that we change, every model that we change, make visible or invisible, needs its own node. Instead of having one list of materials and we grab them by index, we have a whole bunch of nodes and we check if the index is true in order to, to uh, activate them or deactivate them. You can see here, I've marked this node uh, as max number of materials, which means currently in, in this current setup, we were supporting four materials. And these nodes just make sure that our index cannot be below zero or above three. If you're a Python programmer, you might know, wonder why did you need to, new, to use four nodes for that? One modulo would be enough. But keep in mind, this needs to be exported to JavaScript and that doesn't wrap automatically. The modulo is different. So little um, surprise there. So we, what we do is we store a variable direction. The only reason why I store the variable direction is so I can use the same graph on two different buttons. One goes back, one goes forward. And we have the variable that is the current index. And the, uh, the model that changes its material, which is the, which is the uh, just underneath the buttons, this one, this changes its material and it also makes the model change its clothes. So I'm going to focus on how this changes the materials. So the graph you just saw is on this button and for some, time, for some reason, sometimes objects disappear in hubs. I do not know why and it's only some objects. So in theory, there was another button here. Maybe you spotted it when Anya got closer and then it disappeared. So there's a button that also goes in the other direction, which then of course would have its direction variable assigned to minus one. So we add the direction to the index, meaning we either add one or we subtract one then we make sure it's between zero and three, and then we go on interact, we get this flow again, as I said, and there's nothing happens with the behavior graph unless something is triggered with a uh, play button. And then we send the, after we set the variable, we send this to a trigger, and a trigger means I can use one object to do something on another object. It's I think you have three components. Basically, you have the graph itself, then you have variables, then you have triggers. And this trigger, you can see here, it's on trigger, meaning this is my trigger that I called on material change. And then here I recall the trigger on material change, which means every time this button, this trigger gets activated by the flow, this graph gets executed. And you can see um, we deleted two of the four materials, which means we only check is the index one, then this is true, and we enable this material. And if is the, I mean, this is true, and we, we enable the blouson material. And if the other is true, we enable the anorak material. And by enable, I mean we set it. So there is a do once component, otherwise we would set the material every frame, which is not a good idea. And uh, the do once, of course, if I tell you to do something once, you will do it once and then stop until I come back and tell you, please uh, restart. You can, you're now free to do it again. So we make sure this is once. The branch node actually turned out to be one of the most important ones for me because you can kind of uh, convert a bool into a trigger. We just trigger it every time and we only react to it if it's true. So basically, this tree until here does nothing on its own because it doesn't get triggered. But if you use a branch node, you can basically convert a bool into a trigger. So as soon as this gets true, the rest of the graph gets executed. And you might have already noticed that, I'm, I've mentioned this in the beginning, but I didn't have an example at the time. No, these graphs do not need one output. These graphs do something and they can do as much as they want. They don't just um, define one surface, they don't just define one geometry, they just define behavior. And 
the same objects can do different behavior. Turn, spin, explode, go away, be invisible, all this kind of stuff. So that's, I think, is the biggest difference between the Blender graphs you're used to and the behavior graphs that includes animation uh, nodes. So. And now we're coming to the interactive demo room. And that's a room that we, that's a room that we created for um, students who asked us for certain features. And we implemented them here in the demo room. So uh, for once, um, we see an uh, example of baking. So we see a bit of light baking. Mm. You see? Um. Yeah, so I'm looking around and um, you see there is some baked light. And here's one example. There is a figure that's dancing. It's like a motion capture. And um, the problem is that when you have an animated mesh, you cannot trigger this uh, because it would be too expensive. So we trigger it using the door. And then you can look at the dancer. And when you close the door, uh, you can like freeze him. So you can take a look at the pose, the art, and then uh, if you go out again, he starts dancing again. And if you close the door, he should stop, yeah. Then uh, some student requested that we change the materials because they want their art to be uh, in different materials. For example, here we see um, bronzer, bronzer, yeah. Then silver, yeah, silver, and even even gold. And this is for the last one that is uh, that was requested quite a bit. Um, the, um, usually, uh, when you have like a smartphone to use or like a VR, you don't want to click somewhere. So, so you only want to look at something. And this is what we implemented here. So when you look at the image, uh, the trees appear, and um, when you look away from the image, the trees disappear again. So if you want to let I like study them, you have to study them while you're looking at the image. But Behold, that this, you might think that this is a feature that is already in uh, hubs uh, because it's so common when you're doing um, like stuff for smartphones or uh, AR, VR, but unfortunately it's um, not. And we'll see this in the last uh, slide. But beforehand, let's take a look at the uh, baking functionality that we implemented. So first hand, um, is there any, anybody here who ever used baking of light in Blender? Okay, and who enjoyed the process? Who likes baking? Like who? Who's a professional baker? Like who's uh, totally into baking? And he is ah cool. Yeah, you're a rare kind. I think uh, most people are not into baking. Most people want to create um, lighting, and uh, that's also for me. I like to create some lighting and uh, make things look nice. But in the end, when I uh, want to save the lighting, I don't want to work on this like for many hours. I want to do this to be like a photo, like a one-click solution. And um, this is um, here an example. Um, this is the lighting I set up in Cycles. Um, it's, of course, a bit different than the things that we are seeing in real time in uh, hubs, but this is the baked lighting. And uh, if you ever never heard of baking, the idea of baking is that you store the lighting in textures because lighting in real time is super expensive, like any, every light source is expensive, but textures are cheap. So you store the lighting in the textures. And um, like this is uh, one of the examples. But uh, in Blender, light, uh, so baking, baking the light, it's a bit tedious. So we decided to create a one-click solution. And uh, we wanted to call it the big baking button. But currently, you see it's still small. And it's not integrated into the add-on. And that is because, and that is the really cool thing about open source, the, um, somebody else had already uh, worked on quite a few features for baking in hubs. And they were like missing some stuff. And we, we like added the missing stuff. And uh, we still want to merge the two branches together into one big baking button. So it's going to be bigger. Currently, it's small. But in the future, it will be really, really big. I promise. <laughs> and now, for the last thing to look at, this was done once again in behavior graphs, and this is once again something for Frederick. So yeah, as, God, as Gottfried said, you would expect looking at an object to be implemented already. Can you hear me? Uh, and yeah, there we go. And um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, so I had to build this totally from scratch. I asked around if I could get the screen space information of the outline of an object so we can say if it's visible or not. Nope. There was, I don't have access to the Z-Pass at the Python level or J JavaScript level. I'd probably have it if, if I wrote a shader for it, but that's way out of my scope. So basically what I needed to do was we created an animation, which is uh, the trees 
growing, but for some reason, sometimes the trees started already grown, sometimes the trees started already animating, sometimes the trees started when they were big. So we said, I don't know, the, I didn't see the, the uh, how do you say, the similarity or the, the reason. So we just decided, let's brute force the animation backwards once we enter the room. So you don't see that because you don't see them right away until you get around the corner, they're already gone. Uh, but this is something we shouldn't have to do. And then you can see, I'd say this is a, med <coughs> sorry, a medium sized graph, I would say. So basically what I do is I take where are we looking at and I take where do we stand. We subtract from the uh, object that we're looking at and that gives us a straight line towards the object from let's say the chest and then I check how is the uh, head rotated which means we can um, determine the, the angle between where am I looking and the angle, angle between my chest looking at the object. So if the, if the dot product is less than 0 0.3, I consider this looking at the object. But um, having this appear right away would have been too easy, so they asked me to only activate this after a certain amount of time, so <laughs> this unfortunately made it quite a, big, uh, quite a little bit more complicated than I would have imagined because right now I have to start a timer when we're looking at it. I have to stop the timer when we're not looking at it. But I don't have to stop the timer when we're looking at it and look away after the trees are already spawning because I don't want to interrupt the animation. So um, if you're not into uh, de programming or development, this might be really surprising to you if a really simple task like look away or don't look away uh, gets uh, really complicated once the user does something you're not expecting, which I'm pretty sure agrees everybody, everybody would agree with me. If once you write uh, an interactive software UI or something, the biggest nightmare is the user doing something you didn't expect. Um, done. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we're coming to an end. Uh, um, and uh, this is an invitation to you all, so you can scan the QR code or the uh, type in the URL and uh, explore what we did by yourself and see some other rooms we couldn't show here. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we invite you to join us and to, to uh, go the last parts of the journey together with us. We are very interested in feedback from you, what you think of this, uh, if, if you have any ideas how you can use this for yourself especially uh, for education or, or science or arts. And uh, uh, if you want to uh, make this together with us, there's a chance today at uh, 3 p.m. So we get the slot at the uh, conference room. This is the room in the topmost possibility in this building. Uh, above the developer ethics, so we we are there, and uh, you can come and join us, and we we show you this then live uh, on our laptops and uh, explain whatever questions you have. Uh, you can of course ask us all during the conference, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank thank you for your attention. Thank big thanks to the team to the. Wonderful people I had the pleasure to work with the last years and uh, also thanks to all the stuff from the project that couldn't be here right now. Thank you. So any questions? So we can we can we have five minutes, yeah? <laughs> The, the building is an old storage building. So before we took it over, there were uh, it was empty, and before it was empty, they stored coffee and cotton there. Yeah. So 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 like orientation systems. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you just uh, we give you a microphone. So. <laughs> 
So is the virtual building an exact copy of the real one? Or did you modify it, for instance, to make it easier to find your way or to find interesting rooms, add some wayfinding, stuff like that? Or did you go for, it has to be an exact copy of the real building? Um, it isn't. Uh, the floors are an exact copy, but it's quite easy task because it's just straight 300 meters, 400 meters, so it's quite long. And, uh, but we have made some modifications. So we have, uh, we have two buildings, two main buildings. And in one building, in the music department, there's a concert hall. And this concert hall we just put into the other building. So, and uh, the, only, the only thing we implemented right now are those switches to the posters. So if you walk down the hallway and you see, ah, there's an exhibition for fashion and you click on it, you switch to that room instantly, instead of having to run there, which can be quite long in our university if you try to need to, uh, reach a room. But uh, we, we want to have the, the, the content located where it's in real located. So the, the fashion room is there where the fashion room is in our, in our building. So, and you can, if you visit us virtually, you know, when you come in real, where to go when you want to visit this exhibition. So, yeah. Maybe uh, one thing to add. Um, we will implement also the other floors and I'm sure, um, because at the moment we are only on the ground floor, um, but I'm sure when we want uh, the users also to go to the second and third floor that we need to think about an easier way to go there than using the stairs. So we will think about a wayfinding system then. Yeah, and, and we thought about different approaches, how to make this easier to navigate. So we, we have the problem in real life. So we have people coming in, we don't know which is where, and they need to have some, some side of guidance systems. And uh, we think about how can we implement this better in, in virtual. So do, do we have arrows on the floor which guide you when you first say, I want to go there? Or do we have uh, door signs which come up and get bigger that you can read them better? Uh, yeah, and, and, and we are on it. <laughs> Um, hello. Um, the, going from Mozilla Hubs to your own server to host uh, Hubs, was it uh, difficult? And is um, the making of spaces the same if you use um, the Hubs creation tool um, for Mozilla before uh, while using Blender? Um, so so the, the, the migration was every time a hell. And I would like to thank Ulf, our administrator, uh, server administration guy who was really tough and really never, never let us fail and get everything worked. And uh, it wasn't that good documented, and, uh, but, but now it, it, it stands so, and, and we are planning to document the, the installation settings for everybody to, to follow up. And uh, the second part, I think it's... The, um, the, the I also lost the name, but you had uh, the way of creating spaces in Mozilla Hubs uh, sp um, Spoke, I believe. Um, do you use now Blender for it or do you still use Spoke to make ah, the okay. Hubs? Um, so we have some students that uh, used Spoke because they have no Blender knowledge and um, it was easier for them to um, to use Spoke. Um, I think on the first slide there was a green room that you saw, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna. Oh. So the green room is totally created with spoke and um, all the other rooms were created with Blender. And we're also encouraged um, to use Blender because um, some hubs components are easier to use in the hubs Blender add-on, or I, th I think it's uh, easier to use. And also spoke, it's again different than Blender. It's, uh, for me, it's more complicated to build and spoke because it's not that um, accurate. And yeah, but it's open to the students how they want to build it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I was asking myself, how did you test the behavior 
can you test it directly in Blender or do you have to put it onto hubs to test it? Because in Unity, for example, there is a play mode to test. There is a feature where you can, you have to set up a server and you need to be logged in. And once you do that, you can connect, uh, you can connect Blender to a URL, <coughs> which loads an empty room and then you can either by drag and drop, but you can also use the Blender button update scene and it will use this empty room to force load the GLB into that room and it will uh, play the scene like, hopefully like you intended. But yeah, it's, uh, it has a few differences, but very, but they're very little. And I was told there were bugs, but I don't think they are. So, uh, what you want, like, to uh, be able to test this inside Blender without going to hubs? This is the interactive mode I was talking about that we really hope uh, will someday make it into Blender. It will, right, uh, Pablo? Will it? Uh, it will. Good, good news. Pablo said here it will be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I made an exhibition in uh, Blender and then I made it for the internet with Verge 3D. Do you have experience with uh, that? Verge 3D? So I, I think this, I, I remain the name, so when, when we make a research in, in the beginning, so I think this is a commercial product, so yeah. we sorted it out. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the the approach is, so so the, 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 the use case is mostly the same, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you want to switch, you're invited. Yeah, <laughs> I'm interested. <laughs> I think we have to make room for the next speakers, so you're all invited at 3 p.m. in the attic. Thank you very much. <laughs>